Anyways, it's 8.10 and we will begin the session. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another session of SG STEM. I believe this is session 15. I kind of stopped counting after the last 10. Uh, and uh, for this session, we have Sanka from the HSS. He is also the president of the HSS. And uh, he's going to talk to us about snakes. He's going to speak not just about snakes, but also for snakes and how we can learn to coexist with them. So if you have a snake near your place and you're wondering what to do with it, maybe Sanka will be able to tell you. And uh, I am co-hosting this with Marcus. Hello. And uh, yeah, let's go. Uh, Sanka, you can start sharing a screen. Okay, cool. Um, let me There we go. Just... Well, Sanka is getting the screen ready. Uh, if you've got any questions for him during the talk, um, feel free to just type it inside the chat box. Okay. Uh, can you all see the front screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Then uh, I can start. Thank you, everyone, for coming to this talk. And uh, thank you, Kandan and Marcus, for hosting this as well. I'm really glad to be able to share uh, some of my personal experiences as well as um, a little bit of background on the snakes of uh, Singapore. So uh, in front of you right now, you actually have the Waggler's Pit Viper. This is a forest snake that um, is qu found quite regularly in, uh, in many of Singapore's green spaces. Um, but it's not some, it, it, it's, one of, it's one of Singapore's highly venomous species, but it's again, not one that um, people encounter very often unless they go into a forest and look for one. So it's not something that's gonna show up in your home. And I think this is a perfect metaphor for like snakes in Singapore overall, because they really don't want anything to do with humans. Um, their existence here is, um, it, 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 predates, it, pre it predates human existence. Snakes have always been around, like St. John said just now, right? Um, it, it's, it's humans who come along and, um, you know, development brings us closer to these animals and, and we, we see ourselves interacting with them more often. Uh, and, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Uh, but before I get into that, uh, I just want to introduce myself personally. Uh, I am Sankar. I'm a full-time teaching assistant at NUS. I teach biodiversity, uh, ecology, natural heritage of Singapore. Uh, I'm also the co-founder and the president of the Herpetological Society of Singapore. So the Herpetological Society is a group of volunteers who do outreach and uh, education uh, about the reptiles and amphibians of Singapore. Uh, yes, and I love public transport. Uh, I, there was like some blank space there, so I thought I'd fill it up with a fun fact about myself. I love public transport. Okay, so I think uh, generally snakes have a pretty bad rap, like what Kanan was talking about. Uh, and, and, and several studies have actually found that snakes, are, like ophidiophobia, the fear of snakes, is probably one of the most commonly reported phobias. Now, the rate of snake phobia varies from place to place, of course, but uh, it is consistently one of, the, one of the animals and one of the things that people are most afraid about. Uh, it's also subject to this whole range of misconceptions. Uh, and, and something just happened today that I thought might be cool to talk about. So um, one of my friends actually messaged me, said that there was a snake uh, on her, that had come to her garden, right? And so um, she said that her, the, the plumber who had been like in the area at that time had said that, oh, this is a dangerous snake because it actually is raising up its head. And if a snake raises up its head, it's a dangerous snake. Or if this snake touches you, you'll have respiratory problems. There's like a, there's like a, whole, there's like a whole list of very uh, like strange misconceptions that it's not always easy to see where these misconceptions come from. Um, and, and, and I mean, I think snakes look pretty cute, but many people disagree. And frankly, they do need a public relations team to help them kind of um, <laughs> assimilate into the larger society as well. And uh, personally, that's what I see the HSS as, the Herpetological Society, kind of like a public relations team for these reptiles and amphibians because there's so many misconceptions about them. There's so many, um, you know, there's so much bad news coverage. Um, and, 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 and I think it, there needs to be a voice speaking for them because nobody, is, uh, snakes can't speak up for themselves. So it really is something that requires people who love snakes to do. So of course, when you talk about snakes in Singapore, 50% of the time, the question that you get is, huh? Singapore got snake one meh. Chapter is it? So uh, 
for those who don't speak Singlish so well, Xiaxua means to skive off work uh, and literally translates in Hokkien to eating snake. So <laughs> it's like, I think that there's, there's, there's this, there's this kind of a disconnect between um, what we want to protect and what we understand. And until we understand what we have in Singapore, there's never going to be like a reason for us to want to protect it as well. So uh, in this next part, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the cooler snakes that you can see in Singapore. Uh, most, if not all, of these pictures were taken in Singapore. Uh, yeah, okay. So here you have actually a snake that doesn't look like a snake at all. This is a Bramini blind snake. Uh, and it looks like a worm. And in fact, if you see it um, anywhere on the street, it might just you might just think that it is a worm. In fact, it's also called the flower pot snake because a lot of times it's found inside people's flower pots and it just emerges after like a rainy day and eats ants. So uh, these, these, these Bramini blind snakes are, are completely harmless. They're completely non-venomous. And um, in fact, most of the time, people don't know that they are living right next door to these creatures, right? Uh, they aren't worms. You can actually see they have eyes, um, very faint eyes over here. Not very good eyesight because they spend a lot of time on the ground. Um, but you can also see that they have scales, like, like snakes do. Now, this particular specimen was uh, one that my co-worker handed to me. It was unfortunately dead. She found it on the road, and I managed to bring it to the lab, get it under a microscope, and take a nice photo of it, uh, which, which I can share with you all today. So, um, Bramini blind snakes are actually an all-female species. This entire, this entire species is made up of females. There are no males in this species. So they just reproduce using this process known as parthenogenesis, um, where they just lay eggs and the baby that's born from that egg is a clone of its mother. And, and, and oops, sorry, too far. Are you? Okay, go back. Okay, so and, and we don't even know what snakes we have in Singapore today. Like there are so many snakes that we are constantly rediscovering and discovering. For example, Gimlet's reed snake, um, which was actually rediscovered in 2017. The previous record of this snake was in 1933 in one of the southern islands, Pulau Pawai. There were no records in mainland Singapore until 2017. And uh, this is actually the, this is actually what it looks like. It looks like a kind of like a very small skinny snake. It lives in the undergrowth, uh, in the leaf litter. So people tend not to see it as well. But the fact that you know, even in a small island like Singapore, it's we are able to rediscover and discover species that we didn't know was there. Kind of speaks to that larger snake diversity that we that we have in 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 this country and the region at large. Uh, not all snakes are so um, you know subtle. Uh, some are pretty flashy. Some are pretty cool. Um, this is the big eye whip snake, which is the photo that I have in my background as well. Um, and uh, they are the cousin of the very common oriental whip snakes. So oriental whip snakes are all over Singapore. You see them in parks and gardens. The big eye whip snake is a lot more reclusive. They prefer your uh, forest habitats. They love, they love sleeping over streams. And in my opinion, they're just one of the most gorgeous snakes. Like look at the size of that eye. That's just that, like, I, I think it, it looks like something you could make a Pixar movie about. Right? It's just so big and adorable. And on the other end of the spectrum, the really cool looking snakes is uh, your mangrove pit viper, which I think is probably the coolest looking snake in Singapore. It's jet black, it's got red eyes, um, and, and it's called a pit viper because in front of its eyes, it's actually got these heat sensing pits. So uh, some of y'all might have seen the movie Predator. Now, uh, the Predator actually has like heat, heat vision, right? So the mangrove pit viper is actually able to use heat vision to detect uh, mammals and birds, the, their prey, even in pitch darkness. So uh, this is this is one species of venomous snake that you can see in the mangroves of Singapore. And the mangroves are are quickly diminishing habitat. So you're we're we're constantly losing um, mangrove habitat. We have lost much of our much of our mangrove habitat since the 1800s, right? Um, but the fact that you're still able to find these 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 amazing species there is really really cool. Another species that was recently just, re just recorded in Singapore for the first time in 2014 is the blackwater mud snake. Um, so this is a really, really um, elusive snake. Not much is known about it, and I don't think it's known from very many specimens. Um, Pythalopsis punctata. Uh, it's really not something that 
we know anything about. It's called the black water mud snake because it loves black water. The water is black because all these leaves fall into the water and they turn it literally like a teo kopi o color. It's like it's like black in color. So that's why it's called black water mud snake. And because it lives not just inside the water, uh, it also likes to burrow under the leaf litter. It's basically impossible to find unless you're very very lucky. So uh, yeah, this snake was only first recorded in Singapore in 2014. I remember the first time I, 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 I heard about this snake was um, my friends actually called me and I was at a wedding and they called me and they said, Sanka, there's a black water mud snake here. And in my wedding attire, just like, like not, I wasn't getting married. Like I was wearing wedding attire, where, like formal attire, where I was wearing nice shoes and everything. I just took a taxi all the way down to this place and in the mud, I was just there looking at black water mud snake. It ruined my shoes. I think it was probably one of the most worth it experiences ever. Uh, something that's a bit more common is your puff face water snake. It's a really, really cute looking snake and it's found in a lot of these freshwater habitats. Uh, sunbeam snakes are really, really cool as well. We see these sometimes on some of our walks. Uh, one really good place to see these is uh, in, in parks and gardens. Uh, they are called sunbeam snakes because their skin Normally, their, their scales are normally like a dark brown color, but under the right lighting conditions, they actually have iridescence. They have this rainbow patterning on them. Uh, and recently, Adidas actually um, released these, these shoes called the Adidas Xenos, which is actually named after Xenopeltis unicolor, right? So it's actually named after this snake. Um, and and this, this, the shoes actually look exactly like the scale of the snake. And under the right lighting conditions, it's iridescent as well. So that's like a, I, I'm not doing like a product placement thing. It's just, a, it's just like, I think it's cool how nature can influence human design as well. We have uh, six species of bronze backs in Singapore. Uh, this is the elegant bronze back. Uh, you can see this is probably one of the cutest looking bronze backs in Singapore. Uh, I think so because it's got this huge green color eye and a tiny little snout. The rest of the bronze backs, their, their snouts are kind of stretched out a little bit. So it's, they, they look a lot more snake-like, but the elegant bronze back, a forest species, one that's only found in um, secondary forests in, in somewhat mature secondary forests as well, generally, is, is something that you really only find when you preserve that habitat to that, uh, when you preserve the habitat that you can find these species in. By the way, all these photos that I'm showing you all are uh, taken by volunteers uh, from the Herpetological Society of Singapore. So when we go out into these forests to look for these reptiles and amphibians, we call it pupping. And uh, you know, when we go out to actually see these animals, we always make it a point to take nice photos of them because these photos um, end up being used as outreach material. Um, they also help to shed, to, to kind of cast these animals in a good light because again, like I said, they get a lot of bad press. And sometimes having a nice photo shoot can go a long way in getting people to believe that these species, maybe they won't think that it's beautiful, but they may understand why it is deserving of respect at the very least. Um, and, and that's really why photos like these are really important. As well. um, this is one really, really cool snake on the top left-hand corner, the banded file snake. So uh, the banded file snake, you can see it actually has kind of really loose baggy skin and uh, its scales are really small and granular. And that's why it's called the file snake, right? So it's got um, scales that are like a file. This is a really primitive snake and you find it in your mangrove habitat. Um, so the reason they have such loose baggy skin and these small files, file-like scales, is because they are actually are able to uh, capture fish and wrap themselves around the fish. So the loose baggy scale, the loose baggy skin and the, and, the, and, the, and the rough skin also allows them to be able to hold on to these fish, prevent them from escaping in the water. Um, the banded file snake is, is not something that most people tend to see because they are really hard to find. They're elusive. They only live in the mangrove mud, um, but they're not, you know, they're not as ubiquitous as your you know, oriental whip snake or even your spitting cobras, for example. Um, but these are really, really cool snakes because they are perfectly adapted to doing nothing because uh, they are basically able to stay underwater for extended periods of time and take in oxygen, not just through their lungs, but also to some extent 
um, through their skin. So they're actually able to do something called cutaneous respiration, where they take in and take, take in oxygen and give out uh, carbon dioxide through their skin. Um, so that way they don't have to keep resurfacing uh, above the water to, 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 you know, to stay alive. So um, they, they basically can stay in one spot without moving for a very long time. And on the other hand, you also have some amazing colors in the, in the, in the, in, in the snake order. Um, this is Caliophis variopagatus, the Malayan blue coral snake. This is one of the most venomous snakes uh, in Singapore. And it is also one of the most beautiful snakes in Singapore. It's got this electric blue color, a black back, a red head, a red tail, which you can't see. Uh, I guess you can kind of see it over here, and a red belly. So um, this is something called aposematism. Aposematism is when a animal has bright, flashy colors in order to deter predators uh, or to warn uh, other animals of their presence. So the Malayan blue coral snake is one of those species that is really able to tell you that, hey, I'm here, back off. I'm very venomous, stay, stay away from me. And uh, it's, it's really something to see because this particular snake is probably one of the most venomous snakes in Singapore because their venom glands uh, cover about a third of their body. The venom gland takes up about a third of their body. So that is, if I'm not wrong, it is the, is the highest ratio of venom gland size to body size in the snake, uh, snake order completely. Um, and the fact that you can find them in Singapore, um, the fact that these snakes can be found in Singapore's forest Every time I think about it, it blows my mind. And it makes me want to protect Singapore's forests even more. Because once we lose those forests, we lose this biodiversity. Once we lose those forests, we lose um, all this beauty and all, this, all, the, all these amazing things that, that I'm able to talk about today. Yeah. And, and it, I mean, you might be scared thinking that these snakes are highly venomous or that these snakes are very dangerous. But the Malayan blue coral snake actually eats other snakes. That's its main. Um, target food, right? It mostly eats other snakes. Same as the king cobra, actually. So they're in the same family, um, the cobra family, Elapidae. So the answer to that question is, yeah, we do have snakes in Singapore, but, but so what? So what if we have snakes? Um, and that brings me to the next part of this, of this um, talk, which is, you know, when, when I talk about snakes, the um, normal reaction, the usual reaction that I do get is that of fear. Right. People are disgusted by snakes. People are terrified by snakes. And I think that says something about Singapore. The fact that Singapore is such an urban country that the existence of snakes has been removed from our national consciousness. We don't think that there are snakes here. We don't think that there should be snakes here. And when we are confronted with the reality that there are snakes here, we react with fear or we react with anger sometimes. Um, and, and let, let's take pythons, for example. I studied pythons for my final year thesis in my final year project in NUS. Um, my, my study looked at their diet as well as their um, gut parasites. And uh, in my study, I found that these pythons are overwhelmingly preying on introduced commensal rats. So these are rats that live amongst us. They're introduced, for, they're the Norway rats. So they're not native rats to Singapore. Um, and they are also species that are known to spread disease like, um, like uh, you know, androstrongulus or, uh, or rat lungworm, right? These are all diseases that are spread by rats. And because untold amounts in, in economic um, damage throughout Southeast Asia. Now, reticulated pythons are the largest terrestrial predator in Singapore ever since the, ever since the, oh, wow, animal crime investigation unit just entered the waiting room. So the, Reticulated python is the largest terrestrial predator in Singapore ever since the tiger was extirpated, ever since we drove the tiger to extinction. The pythons are the de facto um, top dog, top snake. So uh, the fact that these predators are living side by side with humans and preying on our rat populations in Singapore is something that people take for granted. We treat these animals, we don't treat like th these animals like what they are. They are actually biological pest control. They are, they are carrying out this ecosystem service for free, something that we would pay thousands and thousands of dollars to, to do for, for a person to do. These pythons are doing it for free. And I think it's really reflected in the way that we talk about them in our media as well. 
so of course here we have some Stomp articles from 2014. And as we all know, Stomp is a bastion of uh, journalistic integrity. So um, it's I think it's just something that it, it disturbs me when I see the way uh, reticulated pythons are portrayed in the media sometimes. Um, like for example, Stomp says, man fishing at East Coast Jetty makes horrific find in the dark. You know, and then they pixelate the python because like, you, you, like it's too horrifying to see on Facebook apparently. Uh, you know, this man tries to grab a python and it turns aggressive. That's not like, I think the language is really problematic because that's not aggression, that's defense. If somebody tries to, you know, grab a python and it tries to bite them, that's not aggression, that is defense. You know, a uh, woman bitten by python on second story of Sumbawang HDB block, um, nightmare find, strangles neighborhood cat. And this is all just stomp since until the year 2017. I haven't even included the more uh, recent stories. That I'm sure that many of you read that story about the uh, the dog that was eaten recently by, 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 by the python. I, I think about like 20 people sent me that story after it happened um, because it was, it's, I think it's so ingrained in our national consciousness that these animals are inherently evil and that they are trying to eat our, you know, uh, the animals that we love, the furry cute animals like the cat and dogs, you know? It's, I mean, sometimes it really is like, you know, there's, it, it can be quite scary. Like when someone finds a python at the bottom of the toilet bowl, in Upper Thompson, that happened again recently in Pasir Ris. That does happen. Um, and, and finally, I think a much more recent example was the famous one that happened in Orchard Road, right? Uh, pest control officers carrying a reticulated python away after failing to put it in, in a bag outside Tank Plaza. Uh, yeah, I mean, what happened was someone reported this, this, this python inside a drain. Pest control was uh, called to pull the python out of the drain, even though the python wasn't harming anybody. Um, pull it out of the drain. And uh, I think these, uh, the officers weren't really trained to handle a python as big as that. Uh, and, and the way that they handled it was rather unprofessional as well, where they you know, kind of stepped on it and uh, one of the officers got bitten. It was a whole media circus after that. It was, um, it was quite hard to watch, especially looking at the comments, seeing that you know, people had no mercy for this python that really wasn't doing anything. Uh, and I think that really crystallizes how we as a country feel about these creatures. We don't see them as biological pest control. We see them as pests. When you see a python, you contact pest control. That's just what, that's just what we are hardwired to do. Um, and I could go on about how that's really built into our education system and everything. But I, I, I want to kind of move on from that and also talk about how even though we hate these animals so much, we also seem to love them a little bit too much. On the flip side, unregulated reptile trade around the world threatens reptiles and reptiles and amphibians. Over 90% of the reptile species in the international pet trade have individuals that are caught from the wild. And if you look at this, if you look at these graphs, these are just various metrics of wildlife, of reptile trade uh, around the world, right? So much of it is concentrated in the tropics. Makes sense because the tropics is where you have the most number of reptiles. But Southeast Asia is really the place where you see the most endangered, critically endangered and vulnerable reptile species getting traded. This is an actual paper that came out in 2020. And it was something that really blew my mind because when I saw that paper, my thought was how many of these reptiles, you know, Singapore is a trade hub, how many of these reptiles are making their way from Southeast Asia to Europe and America and other affluent parts of the world through Singapore? How, how often is Singapore the middleman in all of this? And how responsible are we for you know, this global decline, this global problem? Uh, and, and really, the question is, we hate them, but we also kind of love them too much. Like the illegal pet trade, the, uh, the, the, the human wildlife conflict, all of this comes together. And it's really not a pretty picture for, for these snakes. So then the question is, what, what do we do? Um, so this is kind of why we started the HSS as well. Uh, our crazy idea was, you know, we have a really messed up relationship with these animals. We need to re-examine it and teach people how to approach these animals, how to coexist with these animals. Um, humans have a natural curiosity. The fact that 40, 30, 35 people showed up for this talk shows that people are interested to learn about these animals. Um, it's important to harness that natural curiosity and 
transform that into something productive, to transform that into something constructive, rather than something that would, you know, for example, fuel the illegal wildlife trade, for example. Uh, one thing that, oh my God, look at that picture. Have you ever seen that many people in one location in more than a year? Oh gosh, I, I'm feeling nostalgic thinking about it, you know. Uh, one of the things that HSS does that we're very proud to be doing is to bring people into nature. We do these walks for the public for free. We bring people into nature and show them these reptiles and amphibians in the wild. We show them that, you know, our forest habitats have reptiles and amphibians inside them and they are worth protecting. And it's possible to coexist with these animals and it's possible to see these animals and you know, walk away without conflict. Um, the people in black over here are the amazing HSS volunteers. Uh, every, every day I work with them, I feel um, you know, it's, it's such a pleasure to work with them because um, you know, they have so much passion for these animals. It, it, it's nice to know that there are other people in Singapore who feel the same way. And the fact that this many people can show up for a walk where our selling point is we're going to go to a forest and show you some snakes and frogs, uh, it blows me away every single day. And the, other, and the other half of that is bringing nature to the people because not everyone is going to show up for those walks where we're going to say we're going to bring snakes and frogs. We're going to bring you to see snakes and frogs. Sometimes you have to bring the snakes and frogs to the people. Um, so we do have plenty of... Um, relationship with, um, for example, the museum. The museum uh, does, uh, the museum and end parks, so they do a lot of outreach events, for example, the Festival of Biodiversity. Um, and at the Festival of Biodiversity, every year we always have our booth where we show people the various types of snakes and reptiles, kind of like what I did here, but in real life with, with a specimen, for example. Uh, and, and we show them what they're kind of missing out on by not understanding their native biodiversity, by not knowing what animals they share their country with. Um, it's, uh, it's something that we are quite proud about and that we have been doing every year for the last five years. And I think at these exhibitions, I really see how the fear of snakes is something that we learn and it's not something that is innate to us um, because the kids are always the first to come up to us to want to learn more about these reptiles and amphibians. The people that are scared are the parents who are, you know, even though we're having like dead snakes inside the jar, they are the ones who are scared of it. Um, the kids are very curious. They are nation they're naturally curious. Um, the fear is something that they learn as they grow up from their parents and their peers. And then you also want to transform the narrative, you know. Um, this is this is a waggler's pit viper uh, eating a Malayan rock gecko. This was actually a recent record that was uh, submitted by uh, Ingsen, who I think is in the audience right now. Uh, and I think a lot of people would see this and think that it's disgusting or think that, you know, oh, I feel bad for the gecko. I feel bad for, um, you know, the prey in this case. But, you know, from a biological perspective, this is really, really something amazing because it's not something that you see very often. Vipers, for example, are a uh, ambush predator species. They are, they, are, they are a group of animals that just stay in one spot for a very long time. And when they see their prey, they strike out and catch them. So to see a viper with food in its mouth is, is an actual, like, it, it, it's worthy of a natural history record. And in fact, the reason I'm sharing this photo is because this was actually submitted as a biodiversity record. Um, there's a publication called the Singapore Biodiversity Record where people can submit their interesting observations of um, wildlife interactions. And, and that frames how we want to be uh, interacting with these animals with curiosity and interest rather than disgust and fear. Um, so this is the last picture that I have in my talk. Um, this was during a walk we did at Pulau Ubin. Uh, and you can see, uh, so you can see my, my beautiful feet over here. That's, that's, that's my feet. Uh, and you can see that kids on these walk, this walk, right? They're, I, I think this is Ing Tong. So um, this was a walk we did at night for Pesta Ubin. And one of the coolest things we saw that night was this reticulated python. Pythons, like I said, are the center of so much attention and so much fear in Singapore. But the fact that that day we were able to have a group of maybe 20 people uh, safely standing away from that python and observing it from a safe distance, not disturbing it, not screaming and shouting, not feeling threatened by its presence, but just accepting its presence and observing it from a safe distance and regarding it with curiosity and interest rather than fear and disgust, I think it's 
it, it shows that we can actually make that change. We can actually take steps towards coexistence. And you know, people of Singapore, we definitely have it within us to take those steps towards coexistence. Um, it's not easy, but it is a choice that we have to make every single day. Um, and I thought this picture really summed it up very nicely for me. So what can you do? Uh, like I said, learn how you can coexist with these creatures. Find out these spaces where you interact with these animals, where you are conflicting with them. And think about how you can transform that into a coexisting uh, relationship. Make your love for these animals known, right? So post on social media. When you see a snake, when you see a gecko or a frog, take a photo and put it on face Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or, I don't know, Snapchat, right? Like that's, that's, the, that's the easiest way to make your voice heard. Um, and also like educate your circles of influence, right? Tell your friends and family if, for example, they're considering purchasing an exotic pet, you know, talk to them about the immense impact the exotic pet trade has on native wildlife, you know, that's, that's definitely within your power to do. Push for sensible policy making, stay informed of current affairs. What are the forest patches, for example, that are at risk of being lost? And what is the biodiversity that we stand to lose there? You know, what are the environmental policies that we have in Singapore that disenfranchise certain groups of people or certain groups of uh, animals? Uh, that's certainly something that you can do without being associated with anyone. Um, it's something that, you know, as a human being, you have a right to do. And I guess in the larger picture, look at the larger gaps in the system and find out where these creatures fall through. And maybe that's where real physical change needs to be made. Um, yeah, so I think with that, I'd like to kind of end this talk and um, thank everyone for coming and listening to me uh, yammer on for so long. Uh, these are our socials. So if you want to get in touch with us, this is where you can do so. We are finally restarting the guided walks again um, in February. It's February now, so this month. Um, so hopefully we can keep that going for as long as we can. Um, but thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Kanan. Thank you, Marcus. Awesome talk. Thank you very much, Sankar. Thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you. Um, we will do questions shortly. Um, and uh, if people want to like take down these social media uh, links, go for it. And while I scroll up for questions, Marcus, do you have any questions to start with? Maybe I'll start with the closest one down at for by Anbu. Okay, go for it. Please, thanks for the interesting sharing, Sanka, and good work by the HSS team. Uh, would you know of any parental care or something similar guarding uh, a young of N? or similar behavior that suggests uh, sharing of habitats in Singapore or even this region for snakes. She thinks that that, would, that might help with better PR for snakes. Better PR for snakes. Um, parental care is a very, yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm not a behavior, like, I'm not a, a behavior person, but I'm not aware of any parental care in Singapore. I suppose King cobras do build nests, but there isn't like a parental care aspect in the same way that we understand it as mammals. Uh, there are several snakes, like I think, um, Inksen and Inktong, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's like a species of hognose that, that, that does something similar to the king cobra as well, where it builds nests as well uh, and semi defends the nest, but doesn't again take care of the offspring after they hatch. Um, I don't know. I think I think uh, you know. On one hand, yes, we do want to raise better PR for the snakes, but at the same time, I think we should be also caring about these snakes, regardless of how similar we find them to mammals. Right? Parental care is something that we put a lot of importance in because that is inherent to our group of animals. Yeah. But yeah, thanks for that question. Okay, uh, I scrolled up, I couldn't find any question. There was only one question, but I think someone answered it in the chat because uh, H1 asked about um, invasive oh, that's right. species. Oh, just mentioned pythons defend their nests as well, defend their eggs. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, just said that. Yeah. yeah. So yep. let's see. There's some species of pythons that would coil around the eggs and, and shiver to produce metabolic heat. So that might yes. be yes. Yes. guarding yes. or warming up the, the eggs too. Yeah. 
I think there's one more question from Fang Ni asking, what is the rate of new species of snake found or rediscovered in Singapore? Oh, uh, I don't know that there's a rate so much. Like there, there are certain years where there's just a lot that's found and then some years where it's kind of stagnant on average, I guess. Like uh, there's been like one a year in the last uh, 78 years, I guess. Yeah, so... There have been, been, I don't know about rate a lot. Rate is a very, um, yeah, I don't know about rate, but it does, there, there have been snakes rediscovered regularly in Singapore. For example, your um, gimlet sweet snake was a rediscovery. Um, the white spotted cat snake was another discovery, rediscovery after like 112 years. And then again, after another couple of years after that. So, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, snakes are rediscovered all the time. Yeah, it's just, I think it's just a, a function of, of this ecosystem being so diverse. And at the same time, these animals being so like elusive that we aren't 100% sure what we have in Singapore. Just the, the most recent rediscovery, the most recent rediscovery was your Selangor mud snake. The Selangor mud snake was um, previously seen, I don't know, it was uh, colonial times. It was really, really long ago. Um, and it was just recent, it was like just discovered last year, re re rediscovered last year. Yeah. Okay, um, I've got one more question. We'll, we only have time for one more question. So um, this is quite an interesting one. Uh, okay, uh, uh, everyone wants to know which of the HSS team have seen the most snake species in Singapore? In Singapore? I know yeah. Aaron has seen at least 50. Uh, I don't, Ingsin, have you beat 50 yet? I'm I'm well behind the two of them, so I'm not even in the running. Oh, okay. So it's Sarin lah. Yeah, Sarin, 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 Sarin has seen the most snake species in Singapore. There we go. 53. Oh, 53. Nice, nice. Well done. We all keep lists. We all have like a uh, like a well documented Google sheet of all the reptile species and amphibian species we've seen. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Okay, uh, so that is all the questions now. Uh, thank you very much, Anka, for the talk. And I think yes. uh, we did definitely learn a lot on coexistence and on the local snake species, especially the, the rare, some of the rarer ones that you featured in your talk. Thank you, yeah. That's, that's, yeah, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> so um, now I'll, I'll, let me just share the screen for the quiz. Uh, I hope you stick around for the trivia, Shankar, because uh, we are featuring some questions from you. And if people want to contest the answers, we will need you for that. Yep, I'll be here. All right, Marcus, do you want to explain the quiz? All right, so now it's uh, trivia time. So we highly encourage everyone to take part um, and contribute to the trivia pot if you wish as well. It's not compulsory to contribute to the trivia pot. Uh, but if you wish to do so, you could pay now. Um, uh, this number, which is Kanan's number, or you could use PayPal and do include your name so that we know who, who is the one that's contributing. Um, and then if you're interested in taking part in uh, the trivia, uh, head over to this live Google sheet to put in your team name and selected beneficiary. I see there are already six teams in, in contention. Um, so how we're going to play is that we're going to play four rounds, uh, including one bonus round. And this week's theme is HSS. Uh, plus one bonus round. And so how it works is that uh, you could write down your answer uh, on a piece of paper, or you could type it out on, a, on your phone or word processor. Um, and as we go on, uh, after we are done with going, uh, Kanan will be the question master to uh, review all the questions. After we're done, uh, we're gonna go through the answers and you self mark. So it's on a code. Uh, at the end of the, of the, the trivia, you'll send us your answers by email, uh, either take a photo of it or you send us your, your answers. And um, you're not supposed to uh, check the internet or refer to books, but you are allowed to team up if you wish, right? Or you could just play solo. So uh, I see no additional names. So I assume that all six teams are confirmed. So uh, let's go. Awesome. Uh, starting with for H and HSS. Uh, at any point, if you guys want me to go back on a question or stay long on a question, right, just shout at me in the comments or unmute yourself, right? And uh, let's go. Which animal groups are the natural hosts of the herpes uh, virus? 
the simplex virus, which animal group of the following are the natural host or is the natural host of the uh, herpes simplex virus? A, birds, B, herpetofauna, C, mammals, and D, mollusks. And for, you, for those of you who are not sure, right, about what is herpeto or what herpetology, this is your mammals and mammals. So herpetofauna consists of both, uh, no, no, reptiles and amphibians, I'm sorry. <laughs> reptiles and amphibians. <laughs> Sanka, I'm sorry, don't kick me out from herp, uh, herpsop, please. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Reptiles, uh, reptiles and amphibians. Thank you, Singway. Carrying on. And uh, how many types of herpes viruses are there? How many types of herpes viruses are there? Is there one? Is there about 10, about 100, or about 1,000 herpes viruses? Oh, I see eight teams in contention now. Excellent. Nice, nice. We've not had that many teams in a while. That's good. Yeah. Ooh, I'm honored. Okay, uh, I shall move on. Uh, oh, I, I hope people can see the words. I did not realize it was this bright. Uh, question three, there is a cure for herpes. Question three, there is a cure for herpes. Uh, true or false? Is a cure for herpes true or false? All right, I will move on to sex. Which creature's act of copulation lasts only two seconds? Which creature's act of copulation lasts only two seconds? A, cockroach, B, a hummingbird, C, a mosquito, and D, a naked mole rat. I wanted to go for names that were all like, you know, what's the word for it? Hmm. Suggestive. We, yeah, suggestive. And then I got tired after a while. Then I was like, you know what? Yeah, let's throw in random stuff in. Keeping it PG. Okay. Okay. It, it, it is all PG. I went through the questions a few times. Because I think I have someone from my secondary school here. So, yeah, like uh, he's a current student. I'm an ex student. So, yeah. It's okay. I got my mom's commission to be here. <laughs> oh, that's good, Shankar. <laughs> I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you got the, the consent form signed. Yeah. Uh, to which of the following animals do these deformed uh, sperm cells belong to? To which of these animals do these uh, deformed sperm cells belong to? A, the white tiger. B, a pug. C, the naked mole rat. And D, a giant panda. And also, these these uh, sperm cells are like sperm cells. Naturally, look like that. You know, they are not like artificially modified. These are natural sperm cells. And uh, which of the animals do these belong to? Which one animal? White tiger, pug, naked mole rat, giant panda. Okay. Moving on, gynandromorphism. Gynandromorphism is a phenomenon where an organism displays both male and female characteristics. Other than in butterflies, in which other animals have gynandromorphism been recorded in? Other than in butterflies, which other animals have uh, exhibited gynandromorphism? A, birds, B, frogs, C, mammals, D, turtles. Birds, frogs, mammals, and turtles. Yeah, so the photo there shows a, a solitary butterfly. On the left side, it's, uh, it shows a male characteristic. On the right side, it shows a female characteristic. So it's known as a gynandromorph. No, this is from Wikipedia. We should have put to the wiki column. Yeah. Marcus, maybe you should you should go, you know, in, into the back room at uh, the museum, look at the the butterflies and see whether you can find any uh, gynandromorphs. I'm not sure if we've got any at all. I think. Oh, wait. 
You guys are in the bottom place in the back? No, no, uh, we've got any guy in the walls. I think we've got no, guy in the walls. Okay. All right, uh, moving on to the last part, which people may have guessed is Sankar. Because uh, the questions are the speakers. So these are questions uh, from Sankar. How many species of bronze bags are there in Singapore? How many species of bronze bags are there in Singapore? A, we have no bronze bags. Lah. B, 5, C, 6, D, 18. How many species of bronze bags do we have in Singapore? Yes, anyway, of course, Marcus and I got tired of questions. So we decided to give three questions to uh, the speakers. So all future speakers will send us three questions. And we'll try to incorporate their name into our three. Uh, yeah. How many bronze bags in Singapore? Yeah. It's Sorry, a form of education as well. Yeah. So as you go through the questions, you get to learn, revise the talk. Yep. And two, about how many percentage of traded reptile species have been individuals caught from the wild? How many percentage of traded reptile species have been individuals caught from the wild? I can say that these two individuals were not caught from the wild because they both were hatched. So yeah, so th these were pets that were not caught from the wild. So these belong to the other blank percentage. This, uh, the red guy is called Thorn because he was a thorn in my side. And the yellow guy is called Pothos, like after Athos, Pothos and Aramis because they were three brothers and we got them. Uh, they both were thorns in my side. You know, one liked to bite faces and the other one also liked to bite faces. So yeah. <laughs> the Taiwanese British snake was like really feral. It took me really well to get him calmed down. This guy was feral to the end. But at least he stopped biting, but he was very flighty. So this was in Bang Bangor when you were there? Yeah, this in the UK. So this, he was from one of the labs and stuff because they were changing their stock from corn snakes to African house snakes because they made better lab models. Uh, this guy from, was from a, a pet shop that was closing down. And uh, we were like, oh, you know what? Yeah, we'll, we'll buy them. Good clarification that this is not in Singapore. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, especially when like I got my colleagues on here, hey. Angus on here as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I have, I have no so, snakes uh, in my house. Wildlife Prime Unit that joined us just now, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's the reason they're here. I thought they were here for Sanka, but they're here for me. Uh, and three, which of the following uh, snakes can prob growing snakes probably cannot be found squirming around the mud in the pasture reef mangroves? Pasture reef mangroves. A, the black water mud snake. B, Cantor's water snake. C, equatorial spinning cobra. And D, dog face water snake. Which of the following snakes probably cannot be found squirming around the mud in the pessaries mangroves? Uh, yeah, same way. I uh, sold them to my friends when I moved over because they keep snakes as well. And they are like more experienced. So uh, the snakes are doing well. Uh, they have not bitten anyone's faces yet. Did you see any uh, any snakes, Sinway? Oh, wait, you know what? Don't tell us what snakes you saw, Sinway. Don't tell <laughs> us. <laughs> let's, let's not go there. All right, moving on. Oh, we're going to move on to the answers. So uh, collect your questions and answers. Let me know if you guys need any, uh, what do you call it? Revisiting any of the questions. We'll give you a, a minute now. Mm -hmm. You guys need anything? Well, we're close to the nine o'clock hour, so sorry we overran a little today. Yeah, this one will. This one will will be there now. So, Sunda, just uh, keep your answers to yourself uh, because we will mark them later. So if you put it down here, people will leech the answers of you. Everyone's everyone's sneakily just watching the chat now. So yeah. Whether they're right and or Gretel, right. yeah, and Gretel, yeah, the snakes, uh, both the snakes were flighty because they both were not handled much, being like you know, pet shop specimen and one being in the lab, so they were quite flighty when being handled. So, yeah, answers times. Oh, for herpes, <laughs> uh, mammals are the natural host of uh, the herpes virus, mammals are the natural host. Of the virus. And there are about 100 uh, types of herpes viruses. 
There are about 100 types of herpes viruses. Do all of them affect humans or is it just a handful? A handful, I think it would be seven, seven or eight types. Seven or eight types. Yeah, the rest are, in fact, different groups of mammals. Okay, so that's 100. Blistering. Beg your pardon? They all cause blistering. Mm, Not okay. speaking from personal experience, from research. <laughs> uh, and uh, false, there is no cure for herpes. You will just take medicines to kind of like uh, keep it under control mm -hmm. and uh, nullify the effects, but uh, you will never completely be cured of herpes. Ooh. Yeah. I don't know if I don't know if Ing Tong is posting a challenge up there, but yeah, if anyone wants to like <laughs> rise to the cause. Uh, sex answers. Um, the mosquito has a copulation act that lasts two seconds. The mosquito has a copulation act that lasts two seconds. No one to keep right. Well, sucks to be a mosquito. Haha, <laughs> pun. Well done, well done. And uh, these weird, stunted, uh, odd sperms belong to the naked mole rat. Uh, I'm not sure why. Uh, I, di I didn't have the time to go and chase up on why. Uh, but if anyone knows why, feel free to drop it in the chats below. But yeah, naked mole rats, they look weird and they're weird sperm. That would have been my last guess. Like, the rest of them are so inbred. Yeah. I, I thought people would pick like a pug or a white tiger due yeah. to like uh, morphology, you know, you know how people love morphology, Sanka. You know, I love morphology. Yeah, you do. <laughs> and uh, birds, birds are the other groups in which uh, gynandromorphs have been observed. Same way I shared something about naked mole rats, sex, lives, and sperms. So check it out there. And yeah, so this guy is a cardinal. I'm not sure what kind of bird this is. But yeah, they both have been like literally split down the middle into male and female halves. I think the cardinal actually lived quite long. And I think when he died, they found out that he had, well, he or she had uh, ovaries on the female side of the body uh, and one testy on like the male side of the body. Instead of having like a pair of each, he had like the bird had one ovary, one testy. Oops. Uh, wrong. Okay, and moving on to Sanka's answers. There are six bronzeback species. It's the uh, striped bronzeback, the blue bronzeback, the elegant bronzeback, Hess's bronzeback, the redneck bronzeback, and the painted bronzeback. Six bronzeback species here in Singapore. And uh, about 90% of uh, the traded reptile species have been individuals that were collected from the wild. 90% of traded reptile species were individuals collected from the wild. So Pothos and Thorn were part of the 10% that came from red specimens. But I don't know, maybe their parents or their grandparents could have been collected from the wild. And the last one is the blackwater mud snake. The blackwater mud snake is the one that would not be found swimming around the mud in the past reef mangroves. And why is that, Sanka? Well, the blackwater mud snake is a freshwater species. They live in peat swamp forests, not mangrove forests. So they love freshwater swamp forests, which is hard pasture. Mm -hmm. Cool. Their pasture is salty, isn't it? Yes. So the rest of them. So blackwater mud snake. The rest of them can be yeah, found. Go on, in, sorry. Yeah, the rest of them can be found in uh, pasture mangrove. All right, so please um, mark your, tally up your scores and update the Google sheet uh, that we've sent. I would put it here again, tinyurl.com. So put in round one, round two, and round three scores and it will, total it up for you before we go on to the last question for the bonus round. I see two teams are tight, slow worms and fishy. And we'll see what happens. Okay, so now what happens is the bonus round. You can continue filling this for our yak. Um, you tally up when wager your points. And how this round works is there'll be one question 
but before we start, you have to wager your points. And you can wager from, uh, from one point to the maximum number of points you have. And what happens is that uh, if you get a question correct, you gain the number of points you wager. For example, if you've got all the questions correct for each round, you've got six points, you wager uh, nine points. If you wager nine points, uh, if you get it correct, the bonus question correct, you get 18 points at the end, plus nine plus nine. Uh, but if you get it wrong, uh, you get zero points, right? So this is how it works. So please fill up your wager, and this is the point. This is the chance for you to catch up. If, uh, yeah, a little behind. So I see Cookie Team Pambu and Slowworm hasn't put in their wager yet. Oh, I remember, right? You can only wager what points you got from the first three rounds. So do not over wager. Marcus now will find out and will shame you. Yes. At the next session. So still waiting for a slow woman, Team Pambu, to fill up your wages and your scores. Yeah, and you guys can start sending us your answers if you have not already done so. Sanka, there are a couple of questions for you, Sanka, in the chat. Yeah. You can. I'm typing it out as, as... Oh, you're typing it, go for it, yeah. Okay. I'm ignoring Ixin's question. <laughs> Are you ignoring Ixin? Yeah. <laughs> I think we can go on. Uh, yeah, we can, uh, as if people filled up the sheets. Yep. Okay, excellent. Besides snakes, what did Sanka profess his love for during his talk? Besides snakes, what did Sanka profess his love for during his talk? I feel like even Sanka's confused now. He's like, what did I say? Sanka, stop looking at your slides. You cannot go back and look at the slides. So write it down, write down your question or type it out and we will uh, review the answers soon. Okay, does anyone else need more time? Oh, Sectron's going off. Bye-bye, yeah. Sectron. Thanks for joining Bye, us. Sean. Thank you. We'll hopefully see you uh, next session. Okay, so I think we can reveal the answer. Yep. And uh, Sanka's love, true love, uh, you know, not even snakes, is public transport. No, I he mentioned it that he loves... I love, I love cars and taxis and... <laughs> Public transport. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so if you got it right, uh, you will get whatever you wager doubled up. If you got it wrong, you will lose whatever you wagered. So Marcus will now keep an eye and tell us. Uh, at least one. Dreadful wants to know is there a reason? <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, I highly recommend that people who are curious can join the Facebook group New Urbanist Memes for transit-oriented themes and learn all about the benefits of um, investing in public infrastructure like, like, like transport, public transport. Yeah. And this message was not brought to you by SBS. No, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we're having an interesting um, phenomena today. Oh, do I have to break out my tiebreaker question? Oh my god, we get to find out about your dinosaur. <laughs> yes. Right, so, so right now it seems that there are three Three teams that have 12 points. One is Slowworm, two is Squeed Warts, and three is Fishy. Uh, they have different beneficiaries, so we can't split them down. So do you want to do a tiebreaker? Yes, uh, or Gretel says, as Gretel calls it, a tiebreaker. Okay. So uh, what I think we'll do is, uh, Sanka, do you want to give a question and then we see like fastest buzzer or... Ooh. Can, can, can the people own up? Uh, if you're part of the three teams, can you like just quickly drop your drop a high in the message and then yeah, you can unmute yourself? Tweet words and who is fishy? Yeah. Okay. Evan is slow worms. Fang Ni Fang Ni is fishy. And who's the last one again? Squid words. Okay, Sushi is squid words. Okay, so what we can do is we can unmute the three of you. We can get Sanka to ask a question. 
and then we can see who's the first one to answer, and that person can win. They'll get one extra point. Is that okay with everyone? Wait, wait, give, give me a minute. Think of a question. Oh, God. Uh, you, you can ask them Ingsin's question about sinking a taxonomic group. No, no, no. Okay, okay, okay. I, I, I know one. I know one. Um, okay, wait, wait. Uh, before, you, before you ask a question, let me just... Uh, can we... Uh, can the three of you unmute yourself, please? Srishti, Evan, and Fangni, can you unmute yourselves? Oops. Yeah, Srishti is unmuted. Uh, Fangni... Not yet. No, I say Evans unmuted as well. They are all three unmuted. All okay. right. Okay, excellent. So, uh, Sanka, ask a question. The first person to like make some noise. Right. Uh, okay. This this one uh, goes out to to my, to my bro in Pulau Ubin. Uh, what is the name of the dog that just recently passed away oh. in Pulau Ubin? OPC. OPO. Oh, <laughs> I heard. Was it Fangi that, that said so? I heard. I heard. I heard. I think who is uh, who are the three people again? Shushi, Evan, and Fangi is it? Ah, uh, Fangi, yeah. I think Evan said Kopi C. Ah. Yes, I think I heard Shushi say Kopi O. But is I, that correct? Did Fang, but I didn't hear Fangi though. Did Fangi say anything? No, maybe not then. Yeah, the answer is no. Kopi O. Fangni, did you uh, say something there? Sensi gets. Okay. No, I, we don't hear anything from Fangni at all. Okay. So... Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, she didn't know the answer. Fair okay, enough. Well... So, uh, so, she gets the, uh, the point, the tiebreaker point, and congratulations. Yeah, okay. okay. Who did Trishti donate to? Um, HSS. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I know how this looks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, but go ahead and send okay. us your, your answers first. We would, we are going to audit your answers. And then uh, we will, yes, we will announce the official winner um, on, on our website. Oh. Thanks, yeah, and uh, remember to send us your photo and text of your answers, sgstem.talktrivia at gmail.com and video scores at tinyurl.com slash sgstem-trivia. And uh, now we will be showing the next week's speaker, who I think is still here. Uh, oh, and then you also got the trivia pod as well. You can pay now me or PayPal me uh, if you want to add on more to the pod that's going to be and next week, or next week, next session, which is two weeks from now, the 18th of February, we have Dr. Anuj, who oh. will be talking about biomimicry. Uh, Anuj, if you are in the room, do you want to kind of promote your talk? Because it's more fun that way as well. Well, I'm here. <laughs> oh, hello. Um, hi there. Hey, guys. Um, Sankar has put out a really high standard, but... Oh, the next talk, I really want to get you guys amazed about how nature does cool things. You know, um, we could talk about snakes, but all of the other cool wildlife. And through that, you know, how can we look at nature in a different way? You know? So that would be my objective. Through the end of the talk, I hope when you go to the forest the next time, you not just admire their beauty, but you come back home and say, hey, um, I want to study nature because I can also learn about engineering. I can also learn about design. And yeah, so we take a more holistic view. That is awesome. Super. Thank you very much, Anush. Yeah, thanks, Anush. And of course, I think it's always nice to bring the entire STEM of STEM together in like one topic. And I think biomimicry is, is a good candidate for that to touch on STEM as a whole. So, uh, so you guys have heard, the next session is with Anuj. The uh, link is actually now live, so you guys can go and start signing up at uh, tinyurl.com slash sgstem20210218 for our next session. And uh, that was a great one. If you guys are sticking around, if you want, you can uh, uh, open your cameras, on your cameras, and we'll take a wifi before we call it a day.